Welcome to the Winning in Real Estate podcast with your host and CEO of Align Ventures, Arnold Olszewski. Join us as we speak with real estate pros about their experiences and learn the fundamentals of passive real estate investing. Together, we will unlock the secrets of achieving financial freedom by discussing proven strategies and building passive income through investing in real estate. Here's your host, Arnold Olszewski. Welcome to the Winning in Real Estate podcast. As always, I'm your host, Arnold Olshansky, and joining me today is Scott Crone. Scott is a Chicago native and the principal at Coda Management Group Chicago, where they specialize in the acquisition of undervalued warehouses and convert them into Class A storage facilities. Scott has been in the real estate field since 1991, and today's Coda's platform of investments is in excess of $30 million. Today, we'll be discussing the self-storage business model, how to evaluate self-storage markets, properties, and how it compares to other investment vehicles on the market. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Earl. Really looking forward to this. So I know back in college, you had a breakthrough moment. I believe your parents came on a, on a weekend and they broke the news to you that the family business was being sold and your plans of working there were not going to happen. How did that impact your career and and shape where you are today. How it impacted me was incredibly, right? Because that was for 21 years. That's all I knew was a family business. I mean, my my dad and my uncle would leave together every day to go to work. And, you know, my grandfather would take his own car, but it was something that was like six days a week that, you know, the business was always a part of it. And there was also specific rules about the family in terms of how we flew. Like, We all couldn't fly together because of the family business. We couldn't go to Las Vegas because, you know, my grandfather didn't, you know, approve of what was going on in Vegas. There was these unwritten rules that were, you know, really governed our whole bot or our our whole family. Right. And so it wasn't just like the fact that we're selling a business. It's like we're selling a piece of our family. And so it was like it really set me back. Like, what does this really mean on so many different levels? Right. And so. You know, fortunately, my father had time to think about this problem before he arrived. And he, you know, he suggested that I pursue architecture again. And I thought I'd completely close that door because when I was considering college, I was considering going into architecture from uh, from high school. But I was also being recruited for soccer. And I was like, I can't do architecture and sports at the same time. And so I chose sports and getting a liberal arts education over doing architecture twofold because one, you know, like I didn't want to go to a tech school. And then two, I wasn't hundred percent convinced I was going to do architecture. So if I dropped out of architecture, then I'd be stuck at a tech school. And I couldn't think of anything more boring than being at a tech school. This is the rationale of an 18 year old, right? You know? And so that's the reason why I picked a liberal arts education, but I, I found out that I could get a master's degree in architecture with having a non BA in architecture. And so that was a huge game changer. And that allowed me to begin the process of getting into real estate. And then I was fortunate enough to be connected with a a professor who owned a real estate development company, an architectural company, a contracting company. And I immediately began working for him while in school. And that's where I really learned the real estate. And that trajectory just took me on on the path where I am today. And how did your real estate journey progress? Um, How'd you start out in real estate? And obviously, if you could walk us through what you're focusing on today. In my first year, I began working on his projects because he would take his actual projects and, you know, make them a class project. So we'd all have this 50 acre site. and We were told to come up with a plan for a thousand condominiums. And so there's 50 students all working on this, but I was also his TA. So in the morning I was working in his office. In the afternoon, I was working on his drawings. And then at night I was working on his drawings. So from basically seven in the morning till midnight, I was working for him. And so I was fortunate enough that he picked my plan and it converted from a thousand units down to 400 units. And it was condominiums, townhomes, and single family homes. And so I was doing the development side of things in the morning and then working all evening and night, afternoon and night on the architectural side of things. And so that's how I started in multifamily. And so for six years, I worked for him. And then the CFO left to start his own development company with two brothers. And I went with them. And that, you know, my job was to put together the whole financial perform of that of that project. And long story short, it turned out it wasn't going to do so well. They all had different projections. And when I combined them all, it, it wasn't going to work. And so that 
they needed me to stay, but they couldn't afford me to stay, which then allowed me to start my own company. And so at their, you know, very seasoned age of 28 years old, <laughs> thinking I knew everything that there was to know about real estate development, I, uh, we bought our first single family property. We tore down the house and we built a new one and sold it. And my, my three investors said, do it again and don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, huh, that means I need to tell everybody. <laughs> <So> <laughs> exactly. We kept doing some single family and then we we quickly progressed back into multifamily and mixed use. And then um, the recession hit in 08, 09, and that, that put an end to everything. And so everybody was being forced into multifamily. We, we looked at notes. We were doing notes. We were also doing some multifamily. And that's where I also discovered self-storage. And so in 2013, we... We bought our first property and developed it into self-storage. We flipped it. And then we did a couple others. And then that's when we began understanding the model. And then we took it into the marketplace to expand the portfolio. So now we're in Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, and Maine. Well, that sounds like an amazing just learning experience, being able to put your ideas and test run them and really build yourself up and also just being in the industry for 30 years now and going through four recessions, what would you say are some of the key things that allow you to be speaking with us here today? Because not everybody is able to make it through all those downturns and still be able to, to talk about them. What would you say some of those key principles for success have been for you? The first one when people say they're humble and then they say it, that usually means they're not so humble. But when I say be humble about the market is don't become arrogant in thinking that you control the market, right? I say that we approach it that way because it's not to say that I am humble. It's to say that I'm not prideful of saying that I control the market. So we were in single family as long as there was a strong single family market. And when that market changed, there wasn't anything that we could do to change those conditions. So we had to adapt, right? And there's lots of people that don't want to adapt. So don't think that you can control the market or don't think that, you know, this market will last forever. So there's, there's recognizing that there's a greater, you know, market force that none of us can control, right? And hopefully I'm not the only one who thinks that way. I think a lot of people think that way. So that's why I'm not saying that I'm humble about that. It's just, you know, don't be prideful on the market. The second is the how to adapt, you know, being willing and knowing how to adapt in order to keep your business alive. So when the market crashed, I was working with a guy at the time. He's like, why aren't we just doing what we've always been doing? I'm like, we can't get loans. You know, it's impossible to get a loan right now. So we have to change. He goes, well, I don't want to do it differently. I'm like, then, then go ahead. You can try to continue to do what you want to do. And I'm going to adapt. And that's what we did as, you know, we became much more focused on the build side. And we also became much more focused on alternative investments and, and multifamily. There's those two factors. And then I would say the, also, the other one is where my undergraduate really benefits me is be a student of, a history student of the market. So read the telltale signs of what's going on. And this goes back to the prideful thing. Because when in each of the major recessions, including I spoke a year and a half ago at a, in Vegas at a conference where I was given an award of leadership. And I was the only one talking about the, you know, I, I compared today's day and age back then a year ago to 1979 and where the market was in relationship and how there was parallels between the 1979, in, you know, horrible market and where we were heading. And everyone's like, oh, no, no, the market's great. I just sold this. I just sold that, you know, and they all had this, inflated that perspective of what's really happening in the marketplace that they didn't want to study the true factors that are going on in the marketplace, where inflation was, what interest rates were doing, you know, the unemployment rates and all these different levers that are out there. I, I mean, I don't claim to be this economic guru. You know, I don't have a, an economics degree or a master's degree in economics, but I am a student of what's out there. And when I see things happening, those are indicators to me like, hey, pay attention, things are changing. And that's kept us out of a lot of hot water. Yeah, so my takeaways, and hopefully I'm gonna use them as I know that I'm probably gonna see a lot of downturns to come in my career, is think again. Sometimes, you know, you might be set in your ways and 
You might be used to something and change may be scary. And, you know, we're creatures of habit, but to keep an open mind and and have your ego in check and be realistic about what's going on. And if you need to adapt, to be able to have the courage to take that first step, which is, you know, scary, especially if you've been doing something for years and years. 100% agree with what you were just saying. Yeah. I know you're a, you're very bullish on self-storage. Can you tell us why you like this asset class so much? Why does it appeal to you? I literally got asked that question today. We're working on a project and, you know, the question was, you know, what's the deal with the storage? Why do, why do you have the storage? And I'm like, look at the last four recessions. While the economy dropped and tanked, self-storage occupancy increased. How many other real estate assets classes have done that? And in each of those markets, it not only increased, but collections increased, you know, it, rates increased. And so it does well. People call it, and this is the pride I'm talking about, people called it recession-proof. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be that bold to call anything proof in real estate, right? I mean, the markets always change. So I, I deemed it recessionary resistant. It does well or better than any, almost any other class I've seen in real estate consistently in downturns. The second of all is it's, you can study it and you can see where the pockets are in geography, which need self-storage. This is something that we couldn't necessarily do with uh, multifamily. But I can, I can look at a three, I can look at a five, I can look at a 10 mile radius and determine the number of lockers per capita and knowing where that is in the supply and demand ratio. And, you know, are we, you know, below that, you know, convergence of supply and demand or are we above it? And what are the rates? So we can model it out very well. And that's what I was telling the guy I was, who I was speaking with is, you know, this market is very strong in this three to five mile radius. We will have no problems filling this thing up based upon the fact of, it's below the saturation rates and we're seeing good product there. So, you know, what we're proposing in conjunction with the current markets, it will do well. This product will do well. To touch on a couple of things you said, first, occupancy increasing, collections improving during times of distress. What's the logic behind that? What's the mechanism that's actually making that happen? This is not a very scientific, I, I can't base this on science. But my observation of the industry over the past 10 years is that self-storage is designed to solve people's problems, okay? Everybody who's using storage has a problem. And it's not to say that all problems are equal. Some are, you know, I have too much inventory and I need an economical place to have it. So I have this pain or I'm getting a divorce and I have to move out or you know, there's this massive pandemic and my house isn't big enough and I can't, I can't afford to buy a different one. So I now have to have a classroom. I have to have an office. I have to have a gym. The way in which I use my house has changed and I have this pain point and storage allows us to relieve that pain point in order to solve a problem, most likely on a temporary situation, whether that be one to three to five years. And so the reason why it does well is it's more economical to solve that temporary pain than to do something else. So if I can offer a solution for $25, $50, $75, $100 a month, that's cheaper than having to move or you know, having to get rid of something that you don't want to get rid of. So we, we do have an attachment and part of it is an attachment, but 50% of our clients are businesses. And you know, a lot of it was the supply chain. They were having this problem that they could either buy a thousand of the, of the widgets that they needed, or they couldn't buy any. So what they do, they would buy a thousand. And now, now where do I put these thousand things? They need a, a locker. So it seems like whatever's happening, there's always one reason or another that somebody needs storage, whether it's good times, bad times, the reason may be changing, but the demand has been there. And just historically data wise, how did it perform in the past couple of recessions? You were mentioning a couple of things just a couple of minutes ago, but um, if you could just run that by me. Let's have a little conversation about whether we call the pandemic a true recession, right? I believe we are. Other people believe that we're not. So when I say the last recession, I'm, I'm talking about the downturn during the pandemic where we, you know, the GDP grossly dropped. Granted, it was only for one quarter. It wasn't for two quarters, but we had this, this false spending by the government, which is just dumping 
trillions of dollars into the economy, which is keeping us afloat. But now we're dealing with this inflation thing, so which is slowing us down. So I technically believe we're in a recession. So I, I call, I will reference back to the pandemic timeframe. And then I will reference back to the, the housing crash of 08, 09 as the last two. So during the pandemic, that period of time, occupancy increased, rental rates increased, like going from like almost like $10 to $15, you know, a square foot. And collections was at an all-time high, over 90%. In the 08, 09 crash, when, you know, thousands and thousands of people were losing their homes or losing homes, it obviously increased during that period of time as well. And so, you know, it's always since we've gotten into it in, since uh, 2013, it has always been the national averages are above 90% in terms of occupancy. It was such a weird period in history with, with the pandemic. I would consider it a rebalancing. Uh, for example, New York City, there were condos here that haven't seen a price drop in decades discounted by 20%. But then you had the Hamptons, which is a little quieter, not city-like, prices increased by 20%. So it was definitely a lot of disarray going on during that time. And, you know, just to talk about self-storage uh, versus multifamily, for example, and the only reason I'm going to use that as a reference is because that's my specialty. When we're looking at multifamily, right, we're, we're going to look at median income versus housing costs. How affordable is the area? crime rates and the trends, job growth, industry diversification, you know, housing affordability, units being absorbed and things of that nature. What are some of the factors that you need to analyze about an area when looking at self-storage that are different than when you're looking and analyzing more conventional housing like multifamily as an example? In the one hand, we, we also view self-storage as a more simplified version of multifamily. So we see it as apartments without toilets. So I've worked on $14 million homes and I've worked on, you know, $10,000 boxes and everything in between there, right? During 30 years. So for me, it's just a matter of how elaborate we make that box. That's the only difference for me. So how we describe storage as apartments without toilets. When I look at all those things, we do look at everything that you just mentioned. But then we also look at what is the saturation rate. So what, how many competitors are in those one to three to five mile radius? The metrics that we're using is what's our competition within 20 minute drive? So in New York, that's about a half a block. And, you know, in the suburbs, in the rural areas, that might be 60 miles, right? <laughs> so it's a matter of just how fast you can get between point A and point B in 20 minutes. When we look at those, that's how what we're focusing on is that 20 minute radius. And we're seeing what the competition level is. And so we're looking at what the medium income is to determine how big the units should be. So the lower the medium averages of the medium income, then we make the units smaller. They're willing to pay a price per square foot higher for smaller units than they are for bigger ones. And in more affluent communities, then we make them bigger. And that's because in the affluent communities, they're using storage differently. They're not using it as something for temporary. Like they might be like, I'm renovating my house, so I need eight 10 by 20s for the next nine months. And so they come in and rent you know, nine, you know, eight of them for nine months. And then, you know, they're packed, you know, literally every cubic inch is filled. And then other people are, you know, might be using it as a, um, as inventory or file storage or for their business, those sorts of things. But we find that when we look at that medium income, it helps us determine how big we're going to make the units. And then we also can see what the pricing is. We have software that we can go on and use to pull this information almost immediately. And then we can then base our decisions on how we're choosing to move forward or choosing to move away from that market. I know we're discussing some of the things that somebody should look at at a market level. What about on a property level? When, when you actually identify a warehouse and you want to convert it into a storage facility, what are some key factors that you would analyze at that period? We begin with the zoning. You know, is it zoned for storage or is it not? And interestingly enough, we found over the, you know, the, the past 30 years, that in recessionary markets, municipalities are much more receptive to zoning changes than in, in boom markets. In boom markets, they get the attitude like, well, we don't need you. You know, we, you know, you need us more than we need you. Uh, I was just talking with my partner about that today. You wanted to do something in the city of Chicago. And I'm like, I don't want to do anything in the city of Chicago because the attitude is, 
we need them more than they need us. You know, and it will take us 10 times as long versus if we do something in another community which they need us, you know, and, and they're not arrogant about that. You know, for me, it has to be a win-win. And if I have to spend a, an extra 100 times what I'm going to do, then it's not beneficial for me to do that, right? So when we're looking at zoning, that's critical. And then we also look at what the structure is like. You know, is it a single story? Is it two story? Is it possible to get a truck loading dock there? Is it also possible to drive into the facility to unload things? We're also looking at, you know, if it's multiple stories, elevators, uh, floor to floor heights to make sure that we can get the lockers in there, the sprinklers, the mechanicals, and also how strong the structure is. Is it able to carry the load requirements? And so those are the major factors that we evaluate when we're looking at a building. And then ultimately, we try to pay below replacement cost. So if our Dayton project, we bought 90,000 square feet for a million dollars. I can't build 90,000 square feet for a million dollars. So for me, it was like a no-brainer to buy that building. And then, you know, when we put the cost of the renovations into it, it was still less for us to convert it than it was to, for us to build it. Are there some, some factors that you might care about less when looking at self-storage as opposed to for example, multifamily? Are you putting the same emphasis on, for example, crime rate? We do look at crime rate because that, that is important. But parking, we don't need parking. So, and that's the, the property in Dayton wasn't converted into multifamily because they couldn't accommodate parking. And so for us, it's like we need four spaces, you know, five tops. So for us, like a lot of our buildings are lot line to lot line because we don't need to have any additional parking. That's a big major difference between multifamily and storage is just the abundance of parking that is required for, you know, if, if we're looking at it on average, it's one space per, per unit, right? If not one and a half per unit. And for us, it's 90,000 square feet. We need four. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's tremendously different. But we do look at, I mean, for us, we see a correlation between a crime rate and also medium income. So if the medium income goes really low, that's, typically where we see a really high crime rate. For us, it's just a matter of risk. Do we want to spend that much more time and energy in a predominantly crime-driven area versus a non-crime area? In terms of that whole conversion process, has there ever been a time where you acquired a warehouse and going through the process of converting the use, there were some issues, hiccups, delays, or possibly just being, being denied that? I don't know if that's a common thing to even happen. How big of a concern is that in the conversion process for you? It has happened and it shouldn't be much of a big concern for us because we're not dealing with an incredibly complex box, right? And everything is exposed. So, you know, it's not like we're, we're covering something up and, and then, you know, we have to act, be able to access it later on. You know, we've had two and that it's involved at the municipal level. So in Milwaukee, we got the zoning beforehand. We closed on the property. We we're building it. And then the city called us up and said, you don't have the zoning. We're like, what do you mean we don't have the zoning? You know, we have a, here, here's the certificate that says we have the zoning. And they're like, well, it was issued in mistake because we literally changed the zoning ordinance two weeks before. And the person wasn't aware of that. So they issued your, your certificate, but you really don't have it. And I said, well, what did it get changed to? And I said, well, it got changed from zoning. You were allowed to have self-storage. Now you're only allowed to have storage. And I'm like, well, what's the difference? Well, self-storage is smaller, <laughs> so you can't, you can't, under the current zoning, you can't have it. We were able to go and rezone it, and Milwaukee worked with us, and they said, you know, just submit it, and we got it passed in two months, which is the, the bare minimum that was required to do it. In Dayton, they were withholding our financing of a, a government program that we did because they didn't want self-storage there. We had gone through the permit, we were issued a permit, and we were building and all of a sudden they were with, withholding this funding. And all they had to do was sign the document. They weren't, they weren't responsible for the funding. They weren't responsible for you know, doing anything other than signing the document, allowing it. And it became this huge negotiation because they, I said, well, if you didn't want self-storage here, then why is it zoned for self-storage? And they're like, well, you know, we never really got around to it. We, now we don't want it. And they're like, you, you didn't talk to us. I'm like, what do you mean we didn't talk to you? We had a pre-development meeting. You gave us feedback. We altered our elevations. We resubmitted. You approved them. You gave us a permit and went through these departments, which you're responsible for. So how did we not talk with you? It's not like we hid this from you that we were doing this. And it's like, well, it got overlooked. 
So I go, well, what do you want? And they're like, we want a coffee shop. And I'm like, a coffee shop? You know, I said, well, a Starbucks on average is 1,200 square feet. So I'll tell you what. I will dedicate the primest corner of my building on the first floor for one year. And I will market it at $15 a square foot. And if no one rents it at $15 a square foot for one year, it goes to self-storage. And they said, no, uh, we want it at $3 a square foot. And we want it marketed for two years. And I said, if this is such in demand, then why do I need to cut my rent from $15 to $3? Because I can get $15 a square foot for storage. So why do I have to cut it for three if this is in such demand? The lowest I'll go is $12 a square foot. And they agreed on 18 months at $12 a square foot. And we put it on the market. And I told my agent, I said, put it on exactly for $12 a square foot, not a dollar more. I don't want to be accused of overinflating it. And we got one call and they're like, it was so ridiculous. They're like, we want to rent the space. We want to put a restaurant in there. I said, great. And they said, what's the rent? I go, $12 a square foot. And they go, aren't you going to negotiate with us? And I said, no, it's $12 a square foot. And they said, well, what about TI? I'm like, if you tell us what we want, then we'll build it for you. and We'll give you a price. And they're like, no, we think you should give us $75,000 in TI tenant improvements and of which we'll do the work, which to me meant that they're going to get $35,000 for free. And they said, we don't think we should pay rent for three years. And I said, so let me get this straight. You want to rent my space for me where I pay you $75,000 for three years. And they go, yeah. And I said, no, we're not doing it. It's $12 a square foot. And they're like, well, I can get that someplace else. I said, then go someplace else and get it, but you're not going to get it here. And, you know, it got back to the mayor that that's what the conversation was. And, you know, we held to the $12 and we now don't have a coffee shop in our self-storage facility. Wow. It seems like quite a journey to, in, <laughs> in, in that process. Yeah. Uh, but I got to tell you, I love the creative thinking. I love the perseverance. And it's a great example of there's always a way to make a deal. Are there any steps that an investor can take preemptively? Obviously, th this was a big learning experience for you, but somebody looking to invest in this asset class, is there some extra steps that they can take to avoid a situation like that where they're in the process, they acquired a property, and now they're having issues with, with changing the zoning? It's not very common for the zoning to be changed like it happened in Milwaukee. Could we have done better research on that? Perhaps, but we looked it up. It was online. You know, we would think that that is the most current. You know, the other only other step that someone can do is, you know, calling up the building department and saying, hey, do you foresee any changes in this in this zoning in this area? And, you know, I, I'm going to think like 99 out of 100 times, the answer is no, right? Because it, it takes a lot to change the zoning, especially if you don't have someone looking to do it. But a comprehensive plan would definitely give someone a perspective of where a, a city is saying they want to go, which direction they want to go. So a lot of communities have not just a zoning plan, but then they have a comprehensive plan, which says, this is our vision for 12 years. We're actually working with the city right now and we're proposing a, a solution for them. And the first thing we did is read the comprehensive plan. And so my first question to the, the mayor and the community director is, where are you in relationship to your your development plan, your, your comprehensive plan. Because it, it's a 20-year plan and they're 10 years into it. And they said, we haven't accomplished it. We're about halfway done. So we're, we're meeting our goals, but we still have plenty to, to do. So that helps us give a framework of saying, okay, then if, you, if you're telling us this is what you want, then we're looking to provide what you want. And if we do that, we should get our approvals. So would it be wise in a situation like that just thinking steps, right? In terms of first thing you do, second and so on. You know, let's say you identify a market, you see there's a supply and demand deficit. It needs more storage units. Would a good second step be to understand what the city's plans are and possibly go talk to the mayor just to understand the type of working environment you're going to be in? Whether you can get a meeting with the mayor or not is, you know, may or may not happen depending on how, how big the community is. Like if I tried that in the city of Chicago, there's no way I'm getting a meeting with the city of Chicago mayor, right? In that case, it'd be more appropriate to, to talk with the alderman. Our building in Chicago was zoned for self-storage and the alderman 
use that opportunity to have a conversation with us so that we could make a campaign donation to his his campaign. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so he flipped the flipped the script on you. Yeah. So, you know, whatever we try to do is, you know, whenever we were going into a situation, we try to meet with the decision makers to find out what their goals and objectives are. And my uncle created this program called Focus. And it's a great tool that it's like you understand the facts, you understand the goals, the challenges and the implications so that you can come up with a solution. And there's there's techniques and ways in which to do that. And that's what his company does is he trains people on focus. And so we we literally implement that tool, not only for our self-storage clients, you know, when someone comes in, we want to go have them go through the focus process so we can create a solution best for them. But we also do it on when we're working on our developments because we're going to tailor it. If you tell us what you want and we tailor the solution for that, then we should come up with something that you're going to say yes to as opposed to trying to guess what you want. Or going through the whole process and then you, the worst case is, you know, they come back and say, no, we don't want that. It's not what we want at all. Well, if I go through that process and, and hear you, and then I give you what you've asked for, then we should be at a consensus and moving forward. In terms of economics of this asset class, and I, again, I'm just going to compare it to multifamily because both you and I have experience in that as an asset class as well. How would you say they compare in terms of cost basis, cap rates, and just overall profitability upon exit? In terms of cost basis, let's begin there. Three, 400 units of apartments is going to cost $60, 70000000 million. And, you know, it might be worth, you know, anywhere between 80 to $100 million. I can build 800 units of self-storage for $8 million. So it's, it's a fraction of the cost, right? I mean, I'm not putting in the countertops. I'm not putting in the kitchens. I'm not putting in the bathrooms. I don't have to worry about carpeting and all those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a fraction of it. In terms of cap rates, what we've seen is there's actually a very similar cap rate comparison. Like, I thought it was ridiculous. I got out of multifamily when I, when I saw the cap rates go, like, sub five. And then they went to, like, you know, threes. And, you know, I'm like, how is someone projected to make money when the cap rates are that low? You know, it's like at that point in time, it becomes a cash flow and you're looking for a cash flow on a 3%. So, you know, to me, it was like utterly aggressive how how low the cap rates got on multifamily. What we saw happening in self-storage was the caps were typically between 8 and 9%, and then they dropped to sub-5. And some of the bigger transactions were trading at 4, like when Extra Space or Life Storage bought, or Public bought Life Storage. Those were sub-5 caps. You know, but these are billion dollar transactions, right? But for the most part, we're seeing like class C, class B trading in, you know, anywhere between seven and nine and class A, class B, anywhere from like five to six. But right now, the biggest thing driving the cap rate is the interest rates. So it's hard to have a building where the cap rate is below the interest rate. So, you know, before you always had this gap between interest rate and the cap rate, which is a healthy spread, you know, maybe a two point spread. But now it's almost inverted, so that's driving the cap rates up, which should be driving it up on multifamily as well, which is obviously devaluing all the assets. So they're very similar in that respect in terms of profitability. If I look at my operating expenses in multifamily, it's typically 50 to 55% of my operations. In self-storage, it's 25 to 35%. So on 800 units, you know my NOI should be around between six and $700,000 just generally speaking. What would be your goal as a going in cap? I know on an exit right now, you're seeing things at 8% and then they trend it down to five. But when you're acquiring the property, what's what's your going in cap? So a lot of times we have to manufacture that cap rate because the building isn't self-storage, right? So what we're looking at is like, we try to get it like as a, a 12 cap and then get, get take it to, you know, maybe a six or seven cap. So we have that spread there. It's a little bit harder to do it because when we're buying the building for a million dollars and there's no rent on the building because it's vacant, what we do then is we say, okay, in this market, what is the cap rate? What is the valuation of this if it was something else? And so that's how we're evaluating that. So for us, it's not our primary focus at what are where we're going in is. It's more below replacement costs. So the only other comparison is if we're, we're building on raw land, 
but again, there's no cap rate, then we're looking at what is our price per unit. And so we're focusing on those metrics rather than on what is the entrance cap rate. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like overall it has a higher yield potential, even though you're manufacturing a lot of the cap rate because y- you have to come in and you have to do a lot of conversions. You have, you don't have any income yet, right? Then it's 0% occupied, but it seems to try to go in at 12 and then I don't know what the whole period is, but I'm assuming maybe a five year plan to try to then exit at six. I've never seen those type of returns in multifamily. It's definitely harder in multifamily, right? Because the cap rates were already so low. Like if, if you're looking at a 12 cap, you're, you're not looking at a great asset, right? There's something wrong with it or the, the community or something that's going on, which is why it's trading at a 12 cap. So 100%, you know, and that's where a lot of times where I, I got out of multifamily because it was like, okay, if, if I go in and buy it at an eight and a half and I improve it and I spend a million or $2 million improving it, am I going to move the needle down to a six? Probably not. You know, the market's going to still push me to like a seven. So how much rent can I really bump it up is, you know, I still can't just like go 20% above the marketplace because I have new, new appliances. So there, there's bigger distinctions there. So our position is there's always more money to be made in development than there is in taking an existing asset and trying to improve it. Now, if something's grossly underperforming, then I agree with you. Then, you know, the, f- the facility that we bought in Michigan, it was the rents were 40% below market rate. So what we do, we came in and rent, raised rents. You know, we automated it, made it, um, you know, the guy was literally had a flip phone and he had one of those, you know, graph paper notepads that you used in eighth grade chemistry class. And that was his ledger. And he was literally texting people. And then he had a mail slot on the side of one of the storage units that had a chute that went into a safe that was bolted to the floor. And people were dumping cash and checks in there. And that's how this guy was running this 300 unit facility. So we, we put automatic gate on it, you know, so that you had to key code your number into the facility. And we made everything automated in terms of payments and we raised rents. So you were able to increase the value there a little bit, huh? <laughs> That's how we're increasing the value, right? One of the things I hear with people that operate this business model, I would love to get your opinion on it, is a common exit plan is to try to acquire a large scale of these properties in a particular area and then eventually exit to a REIT where you'd get a much higher valuation. But first, you need to reach that scale. A couple of operators that I've spoken to at conferences and people I know they seem to be going in that direction. I'd like to know your thoughts on it. That's exactly our strategy. That's the reason why we're focusing on the Midwest is to develop a portfolio of assets in the Midwest. And ultimately, you made a comment about my coat earlier um, before we started the interview. I'm wearing the coat because we, that's how we created our whole brand. You know, Our brand is one-stop self-storage and it's focused around the stop sign. And one of the reasons why we did that is that we want to have a package of facilities that are all under the same accounting, all under the same marketing, all under the same software, so that we could package this whole portfolio together or individually. If we, if we want to sell a portion of it, we can do it. But ultimately, the idea was to sell the portfolio as a package. Sounds like an amazing asset class and opportunity from everything you said, just how it performed in 2008, how it performed during the pandemic also seems the just the management of it. You don't have, like you said, those toilets and those tenants calling you in the middle of the night. So it, it seems like there's, and the expenses are less, and it seems like you could apply more forced appreciation to this as an asset class. Sure, there's some heavier lifting involved, but you know the spread is seems pretty big. If somebody was to try to go and start pursuing some of these deals, how would they start? Where would they look? Well, I think the first thing to do is is ask themselves, like, what are they looking to accomplish within self-storage? Are they looking to be an owner-operator or are they looking to be a passive investor or do they want to be an owner and not an operator? So when we first started, we turned over the operations to significant REITs and we literally caught them stealing from us. And that's one of the reasons why our company color is red, because that way we didn't have to change the color of our facilities. They were overinflating expenses. And they were underreporting income. And they just expected us to fund these things and then holding occupancy like at 8% for six months. You know, it was just like we were had to move away from them because they were going to drive our businesses into the ground, right? So there are 
third party operators that do well and, and operate well, but you have to work hard to find them. So if there's three steps, if you want to be an owner operator, you want to be an owner, but not an operator, or you want to be a passive investor. And so first identify those, then, then you can determine what type of asset classes you want to go after. If you want to begin in this and be an owner operator, then I would encourage you to, you know, find a smaller one, like a class C. When we say class C, that doesn't mean a bad neighborhood. It just means first generation self stores, more rural non-climate controlled, smaller facility. We equate that to like a penny stock. It's going to do well. It's, just, it's going to be consistent. And if you want to be an owner, but not an operator or perhaps operator, then you could do a class B. We also know people that passively invest in class B. So that's more suburban, could be climate control, but typically drive up. And typically between, you know, three to four or 500 units, like our one in Michigan, it was 350 units, but it was a drive up facility. And then if you just want to be a passive investor, then you could look at class A, which is what we're doing because of the fact that we're doing the forced appreciation, you know, and that's where you get predominantly the income from the growth and then also from the cash flow once they're stabilized. So I think the first is identifying what you want to do. And then once you have done that, then identifying which product types you can go after effectively. I think it's hard to be a passive investor in a class C facility, you know, because then you you're paying the owner. They're, they're, there's just not enough spread there. There's just not enough juice. You know, so most Class Cs are owned by people that are operators. To summarize it, three buckets you should really be looking at and, and asking the right questions for yourself is, one, do I want to be an owner-operator? Two, do I want to be an owner that doesn't operate? And three, do I want to be a passive investor? Out of those three, there's different asset classes that could favor you more. So, for example, owner-operator, Class C, because there's some spread in there where as a passive investor, the deal just doesn't have enough juice. So you might be looking at class A. And I have a question about bucket number two. When you talk about owner, non-operator, in that scenario, you own the property. Who's operating it? You hire a management company, a third-party management company. The one that we hired was one of the largest self-storage operators in the country. We thought with their name and their reputation that they would do well. Turned out they didn't do so well. But there's plenty of other smaller operators that just operate facilities. They are out there. You know, they're not necessarily in your yellow pages, but if you go to um, the self-storage trade shows or you go to buy their magazines or, you know, there's different ways to find out who they are. And there's plenty of articles and information about third-party management companies. Now, are the brokers for this industry specifically focused on self-storage like multifamily guys, for example, right? Every time we see them, they always talk about multifamily. Do the self storage brokers also focus on multifamily or is it kind of its own little community, its own little niche? The really good ones are only in self storage. When I say the really good ones, the really good ones within the self storage industry only focus on self storage. And they, they have a great niche in that because of there's been a lot of volume traded because people are now getting into the asset class because they see how resilient it is. So, we use a lot of brokers that are not self-storage because we're buying buildings that aren't self-storage. But then when we go to sell them, then we go to the self-storage brokers and say, you know, take a look at this. And they're a part of the big companies like the Marcus and Miller Chaps or CBRE. They all have their self-storage divisions within that. Are there any good questions that you would recommend to somebody pursuing bucket two, right? So if somebody's looking to be an owner, but not an operator, and they're looking for one of these management companies, are there some good questions or some factors that they should look at when trying to select the property management company? Just underwriting. Yeah, here's the things that drove us away from it. So I think that that's the way to answer your question is, do we have access to the bank accounts? Is it, is it in our name or is it in their company's name, right? Do we see all their financials? Do we see the actual invoices? The company that we did hire, when we asked them for the financials and the invoices, we literally got a piece of paper, like one of the invoices was a piece of paper with a dollar amount on it. And that was it. It said $1,576.28. It didn't have any description. It didn't have the name of it. It didn't have the date. It just had a dollar amount. And it was like, that, that wasn't a loan. And we got one invoice. And this is in 20, 2021, 22. And the invoice was dated May 20, 20th of 2024. And I'm like, why are we getting billed for things that are three years in the future. <laughs> you know, it was just like, and you know, they, they want us to write them a check because, you know, we're in lease up and 
the expenses are greater than the income coming in, which we expected, but we also expected to be paying for things that were actually being used. So, you know, understanding the accounting, being able to understand it. So a lot of the good companies will give you access to the software. So we can go in and see the rentals. So we can go and see who's paying, who's not paying. So, that, you know, anything that you can do to break down those barriers so you can really get a true sense of what's going on so that you can keep track and, and understand those metrics. And if you understand the metrics, then you can better manage them. But if you don't have a sense of those things, then it's just, you're just going off of what they tell you. And that might not be in, in our last facility. We went in and took the hard files out of the office and then compared them to their reports. And that's when we discovered that they were underreporting the income by over $1,000 a month. Wow. So all about transparency and truly finding somebody that's your partner when it's kind of this third party vendor in a sense, right. which I could relate to, right? Uh, before we brought in our property management in-house, we used to outsource our property management. And then we realized, you know, we're spending more time on managing the property management company and finding errors that they're making than it would take us to actually just manage it ourselves. And we said, you know what, let's just bring everything in-house. But, you know, not to say property management companies are bad. It's just like you said, it's about picking the right ones, which sometimes only happens with trial and error, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And, and unfortunately, we've gone through that as well, right? Yeah. So, I mean, keep in mind that their, their primary business is their business. It's not your business, right? Right. So it's really, I mean, a asking, do we have access to the bank accounts? What reporting do we see? How much transparency? And really starting there and, and seeing if you're comfortable with some of those factors. Right. And if somebody just wants to invest passively, they don't want to have that headache, right? They just want to cut a check and have their money make their money. How would they go about trying to pursue opportunities? Well, I think that is begin evaluating the deal for itself. Like when a lot of people, you know, compare our deal to another deal and they'll say like, well, this sponsor is giving me 90% and you're only giving me 50%. So I'm going to go with them. And I'm like, okay, well, what sort of return are you getting for 90%? And they're like 12%. I'm like, so let me get this straight. They have to give you 90% of the deal in order to get you 12%. You know, if we give you 50% and we're projecting higher than that, then wouldn't that make our deal stronger? And they're like, but I'm getting 90%. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> but that means it's more risk, right? So, you, you know, we, we look at the underlying factors, you look at the market, how strong the market is, what's going on with it. Do they provide you those reports? You know, do they have a background in terms of what they're doing? These are all the things that, you know, I'm, I'm a part of a, a self-storage mastermind group where we meet quarterly. And there's developers and there's people that are buying existing facilities. And as the group has matured and grown, not only are we, you know, getting commonality in systems, because again, now we're looking at a bigger portfolio to sell this with, right? If I have 10 other people that I all have the same sort of facilities, you know, in our packages that are all the same, then we could potentially sell, instead of 10, we could potentially sell 100. And so what we're seeing there is that I know what's being offered in the marketplace is what I'm, my point is. And so is something way deviant than the marketplace? Ask yourself the question, why are they, why is it so far out of whack, right? It should be within, you know, the common, the common factors in there. So if, you know, you make your money on the buy, you don't make it on the exit. And so that's where we always focus on is, are we buying right? Yeah, it makes, makes sense. In terms of just industry changes, how would you say that self-storage changed, let's just say five years ago, and how do you see it changing in another five years? It's certainly gone a lot more online. Um, you know, there used to be a real focus of, you know, the first, the first property that we rezoned, we had to rezone it because um, the existing zoning said that you had to have someone living in the facility, you know, living on site, and you had to have a fence all around it. We're, we're like, well, we're going to be putting the self-storage in the building and we don't really want anyone living there. And they're like, well, why don't you rewrite the zoning for us? Because we're too small of a community and we don't know how to do it. So why don't you just write it the way you want it and we'll adopt it. <laughs> so, you know, so we did that. It's first time and only the only time I've ever written zoning code, you know, over the, let's say the last 10 years, you know, much more emphasis on online, you know, especially with the pandemic that people can rent. And get there. I mean, our facility in Michigan is there's no one there. Our facility in Maine, there's no one there. You know, in all of our different facilities, we've cut our staff tremendously. 
from like two people to one person or even no people. But then we have someone who goes and cleans it and makes sure that, you know, we have to do an overlock or we have to let somebody in, those sorts of things. But all of our staffing, all of our sales is predominantly online. A lot of people project that it's going to go to this model where the company brings you your stuff and then it's shipped to a faraway location and, you know, sort of like the Amazon of self-storage. And to me, those are really aren't storage. Those are logistic companies. You know, it's a matter of how, how efficiently they can transport the, the, the stuff back and forth. We have really expensive communities like Seattle or San Francisco where the cost of the property is just way expensive. That model works. But I don't, I don't think necessarily it's going to go in that direction. So I think it might go to a more completely automatic in terms of the overlocks, all being remote based. But the technology is right now just too costly for that, where you can literally Bluetooth it in each and every unit. And, you know, if someone's not paying their rent, immediately it's overlocked. And then if, you know, they make the payment, they can be immediately released. One thing we noticed on the, on the multifamily side, and you, you were commenting about this a little earlier, is that inversion of cap rate and interest rates that's been happening. And what it did is it created this disconnect between buyers and sellers, right? Because when the cost of financing is is going up and your cap rate used to be a five, it's very hard to accept reality that the cap rate should be a seven and within a 12 month time frame. So it's been a certain process that people are going through and but the disconnect is is still there there's some people obviously getting in trouble because of over leverage and rates you know that are adjusting uh because of bridge loans and things of that nature are similar things happening right now in the self-storage industry how is the deal flow is there that disconnect between buyers and sellers or is there is the volume still alive and, and healthy there's always a disconnect between buyers and sellers in my mind when it comes to real estate, right? <laughs> now it's just at a different level. <laughs> yeah. The thing that I don't get there, and this was happening, is that people know how solid self-storage does in recessionary markets, right? But yet the buyers are now saying, well, I don't know really, really know what's going on in the marketplace, so we're, we're pulling back. Yet that's the time when self-storage does the best. So... It's a weird quantum right now because we have a lot of people calling us to sell our portfolio, but at the same point in time, then they're they're using the justification of the unknown of the marketplace to you know try to lowball it. When in in reality, it's the opposite should be happening. In recession, the values typically go up, and so you know th there's definitely a, a frenzy right now to try to buy self storage, but people are still doing their job and trying to buy it as cheap as possible, right? So that's where I'm sitting there going doesn't make sense that you're trying to lowball me in a in a bad market because that's when rents go up. To recap some of the highlights of our conversation, you know, just overall high level, you know, got self storage obviously historically just performed well. 2008 pandemic just seems like there's always a reason whether it's one thing or another for the demand to be there. Also just in terms of economics seems like there's a lot of forced appreciation it seems the underwriting is also very similar. So if you have a multifamily background, you could take a lot of the things that you know, apply it to this industry. And then obviously add a couple of more things, like you mentioned, seeing the saturation rates and a 20 minute drive and, and so on. And then really lastly is understanding if you do want to enter this business, what role do you want to play, right? Do you want to be an owner operator? Do you want to be an owner and not operated? Or do you want to be a passive investor and it seems like that's just a matter of asking, how do you want to spend your time and how much time do you really have? Would you say we, uh, that's a good recap of our chat today. Is there anything that I might be missing? I think that's a great recap. I, you know, you certainly took good notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump into some of our closing uh, questions, Scott. What's your number one rule for success in life and in business? My number one rule, I would say, is to be observant. You know, pay attention to what's going on in your surroundings and be aware of what's going on. It's something I also, I mean, I became a black belt in jiu-jitsu and I taught jiu-jitsu for a long time. And that's rule number one, you know, be aware. I've never lost a fight I haven't been there to be in. You know, it's like, so, you know, be it's in life, in business, and, you know, everything. Just oh, be aware of your surroundings. I love that. And if you're ever in New York, I'm going to take you to the mats at Henzo Gracie's. <laughs> 
you know, and, and we'll, we'll roll together. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Uh, it's a, it's a huge part of my life as well. I've been going to all the, a lot of tournaments and, uh, you know, I think it's just something with jujitsu guys. As soon as I hear somebody does jujitsu, I, <laughs> I have light bulbs that come up. I got a comment. I'm not a Gracie guy. We're not Brazilian. We were para combatives, which means we focused on, uh, like muggings and gun defenses and knife defenses and all those sorts of things. So similar to Krav Maga? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. It's, it's an art. All martial arts is an art and also very therapeutic. So my other question is, if there's one piece of advice you can give to somebody to help them on their investing journey, uh, what would it be? Be a student of the market. Don't try to be the, the maker of the market, which goes back to our comment about being humble versus bride. I've seen this so many times in my career where someone has had a year or two years of success and they think that they, they're the cat's meow of it and they haven't gone through a hard time. You know, it's like Mike Tyson's expression, everyone's champ until you get punched in the face. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> it's like, so, you, you know, show me someone who's gone through good times and bad times and they're successful. Then to me, that's an indicator of someone who's, who knows what they're doing versus someone who's just riding a wave. We were having this conversation about our family business. You know, my great grandfather filed bankruptcy multiple times with different businesses. And then he started this die casting company and World War II came and everybody was successful because there's this huge spending. Like every, you know, and then you had the fifties the and, you know, everybody was, the economy was going gangbusters. It was like during that period of time, it was like everybody was becoming a millionaire because the economy was just booming, right? So it's when things go a little bit hard, then how do you deal with adversity? So, and, and Scott, and lastly, how can our listeners reach you? If someone does want to reach out to us, we'd be more than happy to send them a couple of different gifts if they reference the show. One is a feasibility study. It shows our market of why we went into the date market and why we thought it was good. But it gives people an overall perspective of self-storage as a whole. And then we'll also give them a self-storage deal analyzer so they can use that to compare against multifamily. So these two tools we'll give them. But if they want to reach out to us at info at coda, C-O-D-A-M-G.com, that's info at coda, M-G.com, we'd be happy to send them those two gifts. And if they just want to have a conversation, like they have this property and they're debating on what to do, or if it's good or, I mean, just this past week, someone reached out to me and I did an analysis for them. And we were looking at like the population was decreasing. The saturation rate was good. But it was like, it wasn't zoned properly. And, and everything that we talked about on this podcast was things that I talked about with him. And I said, I wouldn't do it because, you, okay, the market is all right, but you're not, you don't have the zoning. So what, you're more likely not going to get it. So why put the effort into this? And to our listeners, we're going to have all of Scott's information in the show notes as well. So make sure to reach out. We're going to have his email website and um, it'll be accessible and easy to find in the show notes. Once again, I'd like to thank you for coming on today. I found the information very valuable and I feel it's going to serve me in my career. So once again, thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Winning in Real Estate listener, thank you for joining. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. Share this podcast with somebody you think can benefit from it. And also don't forget to follow and subscribe. If you would like to become a better real estate investor, make sure to download the Passive Investor's Guide to Analyzing a Real Estate Syndication Deal. This comprehensive ebook equips investors with the tools to evaluate deals and avoid common mistakes, gain insights, strategies, and practical advice to make better investment decisions. Download your copy today at investav.com forward slash ebook, or you can find the link in our show notes. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action.